Who is responsible for this. William had already been giving off bad vibes, but now he looked blatantly proud of himself. When Jake tried to explain this, though, Andrew came to William's defense. What's so bad about him? He cheated at Uno once. He literally killed two people just now! Lies and slander! No, no, I did do that. As a matter of fact, I killed you too. I different. I'd remember being murdered. <sighs> Jake needed to solve this fast. After some internal bickering, he learned about Andrew screaming into stuff to release his rage. With that information, Jake reasoned that putting those pieces back together could potentially refresh Andrew's memory. He'd remember That's why stupid. William was a problem, and they could finally get rid of the purple parasite. After a few weeks of running around on a garbage hunt, and with only a few extra casualties, the Citraith headed to an abandoned factory to use its trash compactor on its collection. Suddenly, intruding on the scene was Detective Everett Larson, who had been tracking down the stitch rate this entire time to try and cope with his divorce or something. As Larson prepared to shoot it down, Jake suddenly caught notice of him and backflipped into the trash compactor in an act of defiance. As the stitch wraith crumpled together with all the junk, Andrew finally remembered what he was so angry at William Afton about. He was just about ready to throw hands with his killer once more, but he quickly gathered he may have been out of his league. After the Stitch Wraith flipped into the trash heap, William's soul transferred to the garbage and began forging it all together into a new body. After causing a chain reaction with the old machinery, William blew up the factory and used his I, degree to his I advantage, believe throwing this. into a 15 foot tall monstrosity. So, making the decision to cut his losses, Andrew quietly made a run for it while he still could. Larson, shocked at how dramatically the situation escalated, spent this valuable time throwing insults at the giant trash rabbit. William wasn't phased by this, though, and simply proclaimed, I am agony! <laughs> Did somebody say agony? Eleanor was there, too. <laughs> After learning of the Afton Amalgamation's existence, she quickly launched herself into it to try and absorb its power. This caused Afton to become far more violent, and Larson was nearly killed by the amalgamation. Before it could finish him off, though, he began hearing a voice coming from his bag. It was the mask of the puppet, or at least his delirious mind figured it must have been. Nonetheless, he tossed it at Afton's shins, and the impact caused him to fall apart like a house of cards. As Afton sank into the lake near the wreckage, he noticed Eleanor escaping his collapsing body, and he recognized her instantly. Not only was she his abandoned creation from his time travel vacation, he felt the spite emanating from her, and knew it could be only one person. The woman who he once probably loved, then definitely hated, had managed to become far more than he ever was. And so, he looked at her in bittersweet longing before everything faded to black. William Afton was dead. Now that the amalgamation was destroyed, the Stitch Wraith ran to Larson's aid. Jake was all on his own now, and he wasn't going to let anyone else die. So, he whacked the detective with his battery, and that got rid of the lingering agony left behind by Afton. Now that Larson was a little less half-dead than before, he immediately tried to fight Eleanor. She wasn't impressed by his endeavor, and she dragged him into a highlight reel inside her mind. Your investigations, your hunt for the Stitch Wraith, your failed marriage. Who do you think was behind it all? Uh, bad luck, I guess. Oh, I thought I was being more obvious. Sorry, sorry. Anyway, it was me all along. <laughs> you didn't know it, Larson, but I was always there. Larson, horrified by the truth revealed to him by this master of disguise, immediately shot Eleanor four times in a row. This managed to disorient her enough to warp to another memory, where Larson then grabbed a baseball bat and bashed her head off. This went on in a loop for a while, weakening Eleanor but also not accomplishing too much otherwise. From an outsider's perspective, Larson and Eleanor just stayed in one place silently. The Stitch Wraith was bored of waiting, so Jake decided to see what would happen if he tried to interact with Eleanor without Afton infecting his touch. This allowed the Stitch Wraith to peer into her memories. While Larson and Eleanor were still having their grand battle, Jake discovered Eleanor's worst memory. I heard Billy Dee Williams was in this one. Oops. Spoilers. Confused by what the problem here was, but nonetheless undeterred, the Stitch Wraith grabbed Eleanor and launched her into the memory to be stuck well, forever. Now that Jake had saved the planet from Eleanor's wrath, 
he felt fulfilled in his purpose. With that, he moved on from this world, and the Stitch Wraith was no more. Larson, now sitting alone in the wreckage of a factory with two lifeless animatronics in front of him, deliberated what to do now. He knew this was going to cause a big stink for the police department if he didn't have a believable explanation on hand. So he just tossed Eleanor and the Stitch Wraith's bodies into the ball pit at Freddy's and blamed their hijinks on Faz for entertainment. Michael Afton, now facing immense backlash for reviving the company, had to figure out a way to save its reputation before it collapsed all over again. He checked his plans for anything that could help him, and to his relief, there was a perfect solution. All Mike had to do was cover up these allegations by touting them as fictional events from a video game series. After interrogating his board of directors to see if any of them knew how to make a game, one of them spoke up and said they knew of someone that could. This led Michael to a failed indie developer with a desolate hope for success, Steve Snodgrass. Steve's only claim to fame was a critically panned promotional title for Elk Chips, but Mike could feel the potential oozing from this creator. Steve just needed a spark, and Michael gave him lightning. Steve, ecstatic at the opportunity to make appropriate use of his uncanny modeling style, quickly whipped up a game called Five Nights at Freddy's. It was pretty simple, but Michael thought it was a perfect starting point. After Steve posted this game under the guise that it was totally unauthorized, it immediately skyrocketed in popularity. People were playing it left and right, and most importantly, those curious about the game's hidden lore started to confuse historical fact from modern fiction. Michael needed Steve to make a sequel, fast. Steve then churned out two more in only a couple days to resounding success. Mike realized quickly, though, that these games weren't actually helping with the current controversy the company was facing. Whatever skeletons were once in Henry's closet were of no concern to him, so Mike decided to assassinate Steve Snodgrass and cover up his death with a fan-made spin-off title. With that taken care of, Mike quickly commissioned an anthology book series to spoof recent incidents with Eleanor and the Stitch Ray. Despite the fact everyone knew about these public menaces, the prospect of reading about them made the public immediately stop caring. All Michael needed to do now was to tie it all back together by framing Steve Snodgrass as some random lunatic trying to deface his brand. So, he commissioned a studio called Silver Parasol to make a virtual reality game that cemented all of the rumors of Fazbear Entertainment as nothing more than fiction. Development was pretty standard, all things considered. The studio focused on remaking all three of the original FNAF games in VR, and then Michael personally provided them with scribblings of his own life experiences to use as inspiration for new levels. Alongside this, he also tossed them various circuit boards, notably from Scrap Trap and some old Dendo Skeleton hardware. Circuit boards. He told the developers huh. that it helped Must make the be a surprise. Or later. in game, to which everyone collectively told him that's not how it works. After some gentle negotiation, Michael convinced the team to scan the circuit boards anyway. This didn't seem to really accomplish anything initially, but soon something awakened within the VR game that nobody yet knew about. William Afton, against all odds, came back from complete eradication again due to lingering remnant on Scrap Trap circuit boards possessing a program called Mimic One. Anyone Observing else the virtual space around him, William started digging through files to obtain a more tangible form. To his disappointment, he wasn't all too pleased with any of the Spring Bonnie or Spring Trap models available to him. So, instead, William used the power of 3D modeling software to manifest a digital recreation of his wonderful pajamas. To save his new form, he overwrote an unused Spring Trap model named Glitch Trap and decided that worked perfectly for his new environment. He was considering the name Malhair, but he had no idea how to rename the files, so he just settled with what he had. As production continued and beta tests began, Glitch Trap encountered Jeremy Fitzgerald II, the security guard Balloon Boy chewed on once. Now working as a QA tester, Jeremy tried to write off Glitch Trap as nothing more than a bug. As time went on, though, he wound up being captivated by the virtual rabbit rattling off nitpicks about the game's character models and level maps. Jeremy agreed that this was a problem, and he promised Glitch Trap that he'd set things right and make the VR game as accurate as he could. The other developers, however, felt insulted by the sudden onslaught of criticism Jeremy provided. None of it seemed rational or helpful, so they all conspired to get rid of him. After finding a guillotine paper cutter, the Silver Parasol development team cut off Jeremy's face and made it look like he did it in a fit of hysteria. Jeremy didn't really appreciate this, so he finally quit his job as a QA tester and sued Silver Parasol for cutting off his face. With his position now open, a successor dubiously named Tape Girl took his place. Tape Girl, much like Jeremy, was also unusually intertwined with the history of Fazbear Entertainment. Her brother, Foam Dude, had sucked her into a passionate interest in the company while he constructed Fazbear's Fright. Now that he had gone missing, she decided to pick up his slack and participate in the company's current renaissance. Glitchtrap, upon seeing Tape Girl, recognized her as one of Phone Guy's children and reasoned that she wasn't to be trusted. He had been burned by both her father and brother already, and he wasn't going to let that happen again. 
So, Glitchtrap went out of his way to freak her out as much as possible while she tried to beta test the game. Becoming terrified of this anomaly, and discovering that Silver Parasol was shutting down due to Jeremy's lawsuit, she hastily began to record audio logs documenting Glitchtrap's presence and other details that could help whatever QA tester replaced her. As she continued attempting to delete the anomaly from the game, Glitchtrap devised a plan to attach himself to her virtual tapes in order to prevent her from killing him. By the time she figured this out, it was too late. So, she hid the audio files across the game as well as she could before development was switched over. Glitchtrap wasn't going to let Tape Girl go that easy, though. So, on her last day on the job, he created a brand new level meant just for her. As Tape Girl followed his bunny trail, she soon realized that he was the one responsible for the murders that plagued Freddy's all along. Feeling well, more and more tangled you within the virtual reality, say Tape that. Girl soon found herself trapped within the suit of Freddy Fazbear as Glitchtrap celebrated her digital demise. Now that Silver Parasol was no longer developing the Fazbear virtual experience, Michael wiped all known traces of the company and its employees from existence. The replacement studio was run directly by Fazbear Entertainment, and they sent out some Help Wanted ads to get fresh beta testers. Soon enough, a new hire caught wind of the job opportunity and applied as soon as possible. This applicant was a passionate Five Nights at Freddy's fan named Vanessa Shelley. <laughs>